I trust that you are well. Uh, we continue to be challenged by uh, COVID-19. It's been how long now? Uh, five months. So that's quite a long time. Though some people say it's going to be longer. Uh, there's been some loosening of uh, restrictions here and there. Uh, but still, remain, we remain to be challenged. But it's also an opportunity for us to continue with our online work. And again, I'm happy to see that our online work is uh, progressing quite well. And in fact, I think it's revealing a number of things uh, to us, so much so that even when things uh, normalize, uh, we would continue with our online evangelization. So anyway, our topic for this evening is uh, powerhouse. We've always spoken of our situation as uh, being a stronghold. You know? And when you use the terms uh, strength and power that usually come together. You know? And we look to uh, the strength that comes from God and the power that comes from uh, the Holy Spirit. But as mentioned by Javi, uh, there are differences between the two. And it's uh, very important for us to to realize because it's all about the mission that uh, the Lord has given us. It's who we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to do. You know? So one has to do with the uh, inner disposition of the Christian and the other has to do with the outer uh, call for uh, the Christian. And uh, we, especially hopefully for us in missionary families of Christ, and our families and homes as well, would be both stronghold and powerhouse. Going to our theme verse for this year, uh, Matthew 7, where the person who listens to uh, the words of Jesus and acts on them is uh, like the person who built his house on, on rock. Uh -huh. So the, the, the winds, the floods buffet that house, but it remains uh, standing. So it is set solidly on rock. And that gives you a picture of uh, stability, uh, strength, uh, being uh, immovable. And actually, this is what it says in Psalm 18, verse 3, describing our Lord says, Lord, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock of refuge, my shield, my saving horn, my stronghold. Our God is both our rock and also our stronghold. So no matter what comes against us, we know that there are so many assaults uh, against the Christian life today and against our marriages, our homes, and our uh, community, the floods of adversity and the, the, the winds really buffeting uh, uh, and, and trying to uh, bring, bring us down. But with the Lord's grace and continued help, we are able to take those assaults and we do not collapse. So set solidly on rock. But brothers and sisters, that's not enough. We are called as Christians to be both light and leaven. Now you think of a light one good uh, characterization of light is a lighthouse. And you see that that lighthouse is set solidly uh, where it is, usually at the edge of the shore. Uh, and it's there uh, giving out its light for uh, the ships, ships. So, so this, uh, this edifice uh, is solidly set. It does not move, but it gives forth its, its light. It's a, it's a beacon shining forth. But we, the, when you talk of leaven, it, it, uh, the, the leaven is used to uh, enlarge the dough. No, to, to, to puff it up. No? And uh, the leaven is uh, very small, 
but uh, the result of it, it can it can animate, it can uh, puff up, it can uh, achieve uh, the purpose for which it is uh, being being used. We can also look at stronghold and and powerhouse as the family and being missionary. Now that's that's who we are. That's our name. We are missionary families of Christ. So the family, steady, uh, secure in Christ, a, a stronghold, uh, the, the, the Christian home able to withstand the buffeting of the, the enemy and even the many things that are challenges in life. But also, we are missionary. We are to go forth. Certainly, we take care of our children, and that's very, very uh, crucial. And we offer our homes uh, to be places of kingdom ground. But the intent of God is not just that it remains there, but that we will have the strength in order to go forth and do the mission as families on mission in the power of the Holy Spirit. Looking at the uh, church that was established on the rock, that is uh, Peter. So uh, in, in Matthew 16, verse, verse 18. So uh, Jesus, of course, is the rock, but he also used this human person, uh, Peter, uh, on which he founded his, his uh, church. And Jesus says there that this rock is so strong that the gates of hell of the netherworld cannot prevail against it. But as we have mentioned oftentimes, this does not just mean that it is standing firm uh, against the uh, offense of the enemy and that it does not uh, collapse. But what it actually means is that it is not just on defense, but it is on offense. It is the gates of the netherworld that will not stand. It's not really talking about the gates of the church. And so the church is not just on defense, even though it is founded on rock, but it is going out there on offense and assaulting the, the enemy. So being strong in Christ is all about Growing in holiness, understanding and living out uh, authentic discipleship, being a follower of uh, Jesus, taking in his ways, taking on his mind, his heart, becoming another uh, Christ. If you become another Christ, you are definitely strong. On the other hand, being a powerhouse relates to our mission as the holy warriors that we are called to, to become. That's why that uh, very important verse about empowerment by the Spirit, Acts 1 verse 8, you will receive power. You know? And what does this power enable you to do? You are witnesses to the very ends of the earth. So you're growing in holiness, that internal dimension of, of faith. You're gaining strength in Christ, but you're also sent out on mission, that external dimension of our faith. In fact, if you were just to grow in holiness, you know, we have lived Christ, share Christ. So if, if you get to meet Christ, you, 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 you know Christ and you're starting to live Christ, so you're growing in holiness. But that's good for you. That's what you should do. That's what, that's what you should allow the Lord to do. Uh, in you. So it's, it's good for you. But it cannot just remain that way. Even though when we grow in holiness, we become living stones that make up the church with Christ himself as a cornerstone and each and every one of us being uh, living stones. But there is that other dimension. We are sent out as well. So you live Christ, but you also need to share Christ. And when you are sent out, it happens in the power of the Holy Spirit because this is God's divine work. 
Uh, we are part of the army of God and uh, we face a very powerful enemy and there is only a greater power and that is uh, Christ, uh, the, the stronger man. So I'd like to take a look at uh, being a powerhouse. And as uh, what often we, we like to do, uh, I will use uh, powerhouse as an acronym. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, 10 characteristics, character traits, uh, virtues, however you might, be, uh, you might uh, describe these, but uh, 10 different elements uh, enabling us to be the holy warriors that we're supposed to be. Now, that, that, that term, holy warrior, itself embodies those, the, the inner and the outer. You know, the inner holiness by which we are strong in Christ and the outer aspect of going on mission as, uh, his, as God's uh, warrior. So powerhouse, the very first element, P. And this is very, very basic. You know, it is prayer. That's the most basic because it has to do with our relationship with God. Everything would stem from there. It starts with that, with that relationship with God. And when we have that relationship with God and we're growing in that relationship, then that's when we are able to tap on to the, to the power of God. But prayer is number one. It is very, very uh, crucial. It is of prime importance. So much so that Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, pray without ceasing. Never cease praying. Always be praying. All the time. 24-7. And we talked about this before. Does it mean that, that uh, 24 hours you're in your prayer nook and doing nothing else, not sleeping, not eating, nothing else? Obviously, that's not what is, what is meant by praying without uh, ceasing. But prayer has to do with a relationship with God. You enter into communication with God. You are in conversation. You, know? you, you are there offering yourself before Him and you're allowing God to, to touch your life, to, to form you, to teach you, to train you. So that is a relationship that ought to grow uh, ever uh, deeper. You know? and, and at its core, that is what prayer is all about. And whatever else we are doing, we're at work, but we're conscious that we have that relationship with God. We are uh, having fun, uh, having socials. We know that we still need to, to witness to Christ. So we're very much into that prayerful attitude. Whatever we are doing, even when we are asleep. <laughs> because before we sleep, we offer ourselves to God and... Uh, God, God is uh, allowing our bodies to rest and He's healing us, healing our minds, our emotions, our hearts. And when we, make, we, we wake, we immediately, uh, the first thing we do is to thank God, acknowledging that indeed He was there and He has kept us alive. He has given us that uh, precious life uh, once again, uh, a new day with which to experience Him in our, in our lives. So pray without ceasing. Now, this constant prayer is the key to joy and gratitude. When we take a look at the verse before, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, and the verse after, the verse before says, Rejoice always. Now, that's a topic in itself uh, because that's also very, very challenging. Uh, can we really rejoice always, all of the time, 24-7? even when we're down and out, even when we're uh, facing such difficult challenges, even if we have disappointments, suffering and pain. Well, let me not get into that. that. That's another topic. But it's preceded by rejoice always. Then pray without ceasing. And then verse 18, in all circumstances, give thanks. So prayer without ceasing is wedged in between joy in between thanksgiving. You know? And, and that, that is, is the, the, the key that God has given us. If we are connected with Him, if we have that deep 
intimate personal relationship with him, if we're getting to, to know him, it, if he's teaching us his ways, then we rejoice in that. And whatever the circumstances of our lives, including the great trials and difficulties and oppression and suffering and pain and even death, would be cause for great joy if all of these things happen within the context of our relationship with, with God. And because that is the case, then we are always thankful. But you know that that spirit of gratitude in itself is very, very crucial because in, in the weakness of our flesh and with the many things that we, we face, the difficulties, you know, we can end up uh, grumbling and, and being disappointed with God and uh, wanting to give up. But when we realize how wonderful, truly wonderful God is because we're praying without ceasing, then there will always be gratitude in our hearts. Everything is gain. The, the ups, the downs, the positives, the seeming negatives, everything is gain. And everything works for our good. So prayer fills us with, with joy and with the heart of uh, thanksgiving and this also i i i believe the reason why uh, jesus uh, tells us uh, in uh, luke 18 verse 1 pray always without becoming weary this this is within the context of that story that he told about the 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 widow and the dishonest judge, and the widow was trying to get justice, but uh, the judge wasn't uh, minding her, and uh, so she just persisted. And finally, the judge, you know, grew grew tired of that, even grew worried that the widow might hurt him, and so he said, "Okay, okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll make a judgment in his favor." And uh, Jesus uh, gave the lesson that we should be persistent in uh, prayer and that we should pray always without becoming weary now has it happened to you that many times you're praying for something you uh, you really believe you need will be good for you and you really want and you you tell the lord lord this will really make me so happy and 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 you don't receive it and uh, for some, they get frustrated, they, they give up, okay. Uh, but, but the Lord says, no, you, you pray and do not become weary because it is not so much what you actually receive, but it is the relationship as we have been talking about. You know? And as you persist in prayer, you know, not so much because you, you really want what you're asking for. You may want it, but not so much because of that. Not so much that there will be that positive result of your prayer, but because you know that praying uh, without becoming weary, without uh, ceasing, allows you to enter more deeply into that relationship with God. And, and, and that always works for, for your good. So we should pray with endurance, with uh, perseverance, and even with actually a great expectation. Because remember, God is, God is, a, God is a, a loving father who wants to delight his uh, children, and that's each and every one of us. And uh, there is that familiar thing that uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, uh, 7 to 11, he says, Ask and you will it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened uh, to you. No. And he says, If you, uh, parents, are who are wicked, no. I mean, not, not perfect, because Heavenly Father is, is perfect, you know to good, give, give good gifts to your children. Jesus, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? No. The father will always desire to give good things to his children. Oftentimes without our asking. Many times without our actually knowing what will be good for us. But God knows. And so he will give that to us. 
But at times we have an inkling, this will be good for me. And so I, I ask, and God does want us to ask. But again, it is not so much because, you know, he's, he's holding back. He's the dishonest judge that, that you know, you, you're bothering me. Uh, uh, stop with it. Uh, it's not that. God wants us there, you know, intimate with him, you know, uh, uh, entering deeply, uh, possibly because of our great need. So, so we're like desperately imploring uh, the Father. And so that always builds up the uh, relationship. You know? and, and that is always a, a good thing. Now, when we pray, because of all of this, knowing that our God is a loving uh, Father, then there should be no anxiety at all in our hearts. Because oftentimes, uh, people think of prayer as asking things of God. You know? And, and if, if these things are uh, not granted right away, or I'm facing great difficulties that I don't even know to express to God what my need is, then I'm, I'm anxious. What will tomorrow be like? You know? But that is not the way we need to be if we are in the hands of uh, such a uh, loving God. And we, we, we read in uh, Philippians 4, Verse 6, it uh, says here, Have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. So, again, even without our asking, God knows. And, and at the opportune time, God will do uh, the good that He knows uh, we deserve, and, and the timing is right. You know? But here, given our, our fallen human nature, the weakness of our flesh, we understand that we can go into the very presence of God and lay our case be, before Him. You know? And we can make our requests known to Him. And once we've done that, we've laid it at God's feet. And we have the assurance that God does not ignore us, does not hate us, uh, does not think we are undeserving. You know? We lay it at His feet and we can rest secure. It, 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 is, it is there. And we do not have to have anxiety at all. You know, anxiety is a killer, uh, medically speaking, uh, health-wise. Uh, many people, uh, the, the medical uh, professionals say, you know, it's, it's really the anxiety that, that gets you and causes uh, so much uh, emotional uh, problems. So this is a wonderful thing that, yes, we do have difficulties that come uh, to us in life, but we can lay our requests at the feet of our Father and we need not be uh, anxious in everything. No exceptions, big and small, uh, everything. And when, when we do that, the next verse, verse 7, it says, Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ, Christ Jesus. Then you will be at peace. Then you will not be troubled. Then you don't have to lose any, any, any sleep because of the big problem that you are facing. You've laid it before your God, who is all-powerful, who loves you with an eternal love, who will give you whatever it is uh, he, he knows is, is good for you. And so you can just leave it at that. Now, uh, earlier we talked of uh, joy you know, uh, in this uh, relationship of prayer. Now we talk of peace. These are the two things that people in the world are looking for. Joy and peace. And these are the things that oftentimes escape them. There's so many uh, trials in life that bring uh, distress, sadness, uh, sorrow. And there are many uh, problems that uh, my heart is not at peace. But imagine a life where even in the midst of these things, because they will be there. We, we, we don't say that uh, uh, they are not there. They are there. And they continue to, 
to to come at us and oppressing us at, at times. But in the midst of that, because we pray, then uh, uh, our hearts are joyful and our hearts are at peace. So the very first thing, if we are to experience the power of God in our lives, is prayer. And that's P. Now when we pray, because uh, God is all-powerful, God is uh, totally in charge of our lives, uh, God can uh, grant us whatever we need or even desire in life. So when we pray, what should accompany that is uh, an offering of ourselves. Here, here I am, Lord. I am yours. I am, uh, I am your, your, your son. Or, or Jesus, I am your uh, disciple. I am your uh, servant. Uh, Holy Spirit, I am your uh, soldier. So here I am. It's, it's, based, it's an offering of play, uh, self. So the second aspect of being a powerhouse is O, offering of self. Now when we consider offering uh, in the Old Testament, in the lives of the chosen people of God, uh, Israel, uh, they would offer uh, sheep or, or lambs uh, that would be without blemish. That would be spotless. You, know? you offer the best of your, 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 your flock. Now, when we talk of offering ourselves, we are with blemish. <laughs> uh, uh, we certainly are far from perfection. We, we are all sinners. And that could, in a way, make us unworthy. And in fact, if not for, for, for God allowing unworthy people like us with our good deeds as just like dirty rags uh, into his very presence is, you know, is, is, so, is so wonderful. You know? And God accepts us as we are. Uh, some very sinful, some not so sinful. But uh, here it is. God accepts us, but our desire should be because we are coming before this great and wonderful God. Our desire should be to be as, as less sinful as we can be. Now, since that is a process, can you then imagine if we're praying every day, if we're offering ourselves to God every day, and we, we know, oh, I, I fall short. <laughs> God, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm offering myself, but I'm such an, an unworthy offering. I'm not a spotless lamb. But we cannot keep doing that and not doing anything about it. We would be hypocritical. So what would happen is each and every day as we continue to pray, we ought to strive to have less and less sin in our lives. To be worthy as we offer ourselves. In fact, the, the, the demands of the Christian life are actually uh, very, very high. You, you know that the, the uh, intent of God is for all of us to be holy, to attain to holiness and to uh, Christian perfection. You know? But when it comes to, to, to sin, and we're all sinners, this is what John uh, tells us in... Uh, his first letter, 1 John 3, verse 6. No one who remains in him sins. No one who remains in Christ sins. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Oh, this is very challenging. If, if, if you remain in Christ, you don't sin. And if, if you sin, you don't really know him. <laughs> and, and in verse 9, it says, no one who is begotten by God commits sin because God's seed remains in him. So we are begotten uh, of, uh, by God. We are in Christ. But it's, John says, uh, no one who is begotten by God commits sin. Why do we commit sin? We do commit sin. And, and 
uh, he says further here, he cannot sin because he is begotten by God. If we are truly begotten by God, if we understood that, if we try to live it out by the grace of God, by the power of His Spirit, then we will not sin. I mean, there have been saints. No? Uh, of course, there is the, uh, the, the, the perfect uh, uh, human being, our uh, Mother Mary, not talking of uh, Christ Himself, who is perfect God, perfect man, but uh, our, our Mother Mary, who is uh, without sin. No? And then there have been many saints, so it is something that not only can be done, can happen, but God's intent is that it should happen. We should strive to be in a state of sinlessness because this is what it means to be begotten by God. And we are not supposed to, 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 to sin. Uh, in 1 John 3 verse 5, it says here, You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So Jesus came in order to take away our sins, to, uh, to pay for our sins with his uh, very life, and to bring us to uh, salvation. So Jesus is uh, holiness uh, personified, but what, what this is saying uh, to us, is that we uh, know Jesus, he has been revealed to us, and he is the sinless, spotless, sacrificial lamb, and we ought to be as well. We are to be holy as Christ is holy. Remember, that's what it says. Uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 15 to 16. Uh, I see you is holy. You know, he has called you to be holy because I am, I am holy. Uh, that, that is God's call. That is God's intent for each and every one of, of us. Then in verse 8, 1 John 3 verse 8 says here, Whoever sins belongs to the devil because the devil has sinned from the beginning. Indeed, the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. And, and in this world, there are only two dominions. The dominion of God and the dominion of the evil one. In this world, we only have two choices as to uh, whom we would belong to. We either belong to God or to the enemy. And there are some who, well, they, uh, unlike the Satanists, who actually uh, affirm their belonging to, to Satan, uh, there are many, many others who would not do that, but by not affirming that they belong to, to God, then, you know, if, if you cannot be there with God, then where will you be? You will be out there and under the dominion of the enemy. Jesus says, who is he is with not with me is against me. Oh Lord, I, I, I wasn't against you. I mean, I, I, I just uh, didn't really follow in your footsteps and I'm not trying to, to be holy, but I've never spoken against you. I'm not against you. But that's what Jesus says. Whoever is not with me is against me. Oh. It's either or. And if you straddle the fence, if you don't make a decision, you have made a decision. If your decision is not overtly uh, to be with Jesus, then you end up being uh, against him. So, here, it is very, very, very dire. Whoever sins belongs to the devil. And again, we sin. Let that, let that sink in. Here we are. We're in Christ. We, we cling to Christ 24-7 uh, for, for Jesus, uh, praying every day. Uh, but then as we sin, you know, that, 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 that connection is somehow uh, being disturbed and depending, of course, on the gravity of the sin, uh, is pulling us away, is tearing us away from our our God and moving us into uh, the, the, the wrong uh, direction. So this should be very sobering for us. It's not just a question of, of uh, you know, uh, if, if, if I fail to take the really positive steps of belonging to, to Christ and growing in holiness, if I just... 
you know, uh, be, be a good person. I'm, I'm out there in the world. I'm, I'm a good person. I don't try to, uh, to do ill with, with, with others. It cannot just be that. Because the enemy is always uh, pulling us in, in his direction. And if we're not secure in the embrace of Christ, then uh, we really can end up uh, belonging to the devil. You know? And the devil has sinned from the beginning, and the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. So the devil is our enemy. You know that. <laughs> but but uh, uh, would we ever realize that uh, when we uh, sin, again, depending on the gravity, but if we persist in sin, if uh, it's, it's not that every day we are praying and, and uh, striving to become uh, a more perfect offering uh, to our God, uh, if we're not uh, doing that, then we are, you know, we, we might drift into the enemy camp. And before we know it, we're under the dominion of that enemy. So it is important that we are to experience the power of God that we offer ourselves every time we pray. Yeah. And the rest of the time, strive to make ourselves a more and more worthy offering and less and less sin in our lives. Okay, moving on to the third attribute. When we offer ourselves, then that actually means you are giving your all. You, you, you cannot have that sacrificial lamb you know, in, in uh, uh, Israel before being brought to the temple to be offered and say to the priest, uh, well, just, just take uh, his foot. <laughs> no. Here is the lamb. Here is the, the total offering. Uh, take it all. It is, it is for the Lord. So when we offer ourselves, we give our all. And when we give our all, that obviously includes our very life, you know, the fullness, everything that we are, you know, we give to, 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 to God. And this brings us to the third element, uh, W, witnessing. The word witness uh, comes from the Greek martus, which means uh, martyr. And in fact, the ultimate witness is to be able to give your life for the cause of Christ. So that's how we understand the martyrs, those who were uh, crucified and fed to the lions and burned at the stake uh, because of their faith. They didn't want to turn away from their faith. So they, they uh, gave of themselves. They gave all, uh, including their very lives. That's the ultimate witness. Not everyone to be called to that will be called to that kind of martyrdom, but everyone is called to be a martyr, a martus, a witness. No. We we witness to to Christ and uh, who Christ is. Our our light ought to uh, shine forth. No, that 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 uh, witness. Uh, this is what it says in. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16. Let me see, where is that? Matthew 5, verse 16. Just so, your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. That's witnessing. Your light shines forth. Others see he is a good person. His speech is, is good and noble. What he does is uh, very upbuilding. And I know him to be a committed Christian. So uh, it, it ultimately re redounds to uh, people uh, giving glory to the Father, uh, to God, who is able to, uh, to do those wonderful works uh, in and through us. So our light should shine forth. And that is what witnessing is about. In witnessing, we need to be bold. And, and we need to say that because uh, there are many who uh, 
uh, well are, are uh, convinced of, of uh, the the necessity to uh, speak up for the faith, but are not bold enough. They have many many fears. They have many insecurities, uh, and and you know they they just uh, don't go forth and boldly proclaim Christ. But that is what we are called. To, to, to be and to do, to be bold. Let's see what it says in uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 to 8. For this reason, I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of my hands. Paul prayed over him for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now each of us has undergone the so-called baptism in the Holy Spirit, as an adult, apart from the sacrament of baptism. And we've been prayed over with, uh, oftentimes with the imposition of hands, and we have received the Spirit. We have been filled by the Spirit. We uh, have been empowered by the, the, the Spirit. Now, out of what should come out of that is boldness in proclaiming the gospel. And so Paul tells Timothy in verse 7, for God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. That's the spirit of God. And, and we ourselves might be, you know, we, we've never done this before. And we've never gone into the fray with people who oppose us, who are antagonistic to the, to the faith. And, you know, uh, we, we can experience some, some, some fear. But in spite of that fear... The Spirit of God that is there, we allow the Spirit of God to, to work in us so that we would uh, speak, you know, not be cowardly as far as the proclamation of the faith, but go forth in the power of that Spirit with, with, with love and self-control. And in verse 8, he says, So do not be ashamed of your testimony to our Lord. Never be ashamed. Of that testimony. Jesus himself says, if you are ashamed of me uh, before others, then uh, I will also be ashamed of you. Uh, and and how, how can we ever be ashamed of this God? This wonderful God that, that, that we, we know is, is all good. And we can only be proud of such a God. We should, we should be eager to proclaim uh, Christ, to tell people about how wonderful this, this God is and what he has done for us. Why should we be ashamed? You're not ashamed of, of a good thing. No. But if, if uh, uh, you know, we were not ashamed, we proclaim the gospel and it doesn't go well with, with others and in today's world, it's not just they will turn away from you or reject you or not listen to you, but they would even oppress you, as many Christians are being uh, oppressed uh, in the world today. Then what you get is the great privilege of suffering for the gospel. Uh -huh. So our privilege is not only to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim Christ, but to suffer for the gospel, to suffer for Christ. And that is a good thing. No. Paul was so elated when he was uh, uh, relating in 2 Corinthians 11 all the things that he had to undergo, all the sufferings. He was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was betrayed, and uh, he, he, he fasted, and, and so many, so many things that happened to him, and it really seemed as if he was wearing it as a badge of honor. No. Kind of like saying, hey, look, look what happened to me. No. And I'm so greatly privileged uh, that I, God allowed me to suffer for my Lord. Uh, and, and I rejoice in, in that. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. When people accept what you have to say, it's a good thing. When people don't accept and because of that they oppose you, they oppress you, they persecute you, it's still a good thing for you. Never any loss. Only gain when we witness to, to Christ. So in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, Paul says, So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. 
We represent God. We represent Christ. We are the ones at the forefront. Think of ambassadors. The, 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 uh, the uh, government officials of a particular country, uh, they know who the leader of the, that, that country that is represented is. They know, but they've never met him. No, they, they don't interact with him. But they, the person they interact with is the ambassador. He represents that government. So here we are. We represent Christ as ambassadors of, of God. And God is appealing through us, just as the secular government would use their, their ambassadors to, you know, to, 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 uh, to, to talk with the local officials, to, to sort things out and their troubles and difficulties, to make requests and, and appeals. It's the same thing. God is appealing uh, through us. So, brothers and sisters, we stand in the very place of Jesus and we do his very work. That is what it means to be a witness. And, and uh, we, we need to have that, that posture, that, that heart, uh, in order to really tap onto the power of God in our life and work. So that's W, witnessing. Now we go on to the fourth aspect or element of being a holy warrior. So you are prayerful, you offer yourself, and you are striving to be a witness. So those are the basics. The basics are in place. But if you are to go forth in the power of the Spirit, you need to be equipped. Why? Because this is war. What are we equipped for? Uh, the, 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 the fourth uh, word is equipped. E, equipped. What are we equipped for? For war. We, when, whenever we do the work of, of Christ, whenever we proclaim the gospel, we engage in spiritual war. And it's the most vicious war because it is against uh, that evil being, uh, Satan, who, who is, is uh, very powerful, who has uh, very many demons at his uh, command, uh, and in fact, controlling uh, many powerful persons and institutions in the world today, doing his bidding, doing his work. So that is what we face. We, we face a powerful uh, enemy. And we need to be equipped. Otherwise, we're going to be slaughtered. You know? And, and the, the enemy has uh, tremendous weapons at uh, his disposal. So we need to have those weapons as well. And this, this equipment, as we enter into war, is important because this is a fight for souls. It is, it is about the salvation of people that Jesus already redeemed. This is what this war is all about. It is about the, the eternal, uh, 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 what, what happens in eternity. To, to, to people, whether they go up to heaven or they go, go to hell. So this is about a soul. So it is very, very important. So how are we equipped? Well, you're, you're quite familiar with the armor of God, but let's uh, uh, take a closer look at that. Uh, we put on the armor of God. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18. In verse 10, Paul says, Finally, Draw your strength from the Lord and from his mighty power. Strength and power. Where do you get strength and power? From the Lord. So, uh, so then he moves on and he says, Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to withstand firm against the tactics of the devil. So the devil is whom we face. And we need to put on the armor of God. And then Paul stresses further what this spiritual war is all about. Because there are many people in the world, Christians, who are not aware of such spiritual war. All they see are the, the wrong things like uh, poverty, corruption, uh, pollution, social injustice, 
So that is what is before their eyes. But that's only the surface. The real war is beneath the surface or, or, or invisible in the heavens. You know? the, the struggle between uh, the angels of God and the demons of Satan. That is the real war that we is raging. And that is the war that we enter into. So in verse 12, Paul says, For our struggle is not, not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. And these evil spirits are power. They are principalities. They control territories. You know? They are world rulers are extending uh, the darkness of evil within their, their territorial uh, uh, influence. So this is, this is what this is about. So he says in verse 13, Therefore, put on the armor of God that you may be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to hold your ground. For you to be able to resist. You put on that armor. Stand fast. Hold your ground. Do not, do not retreat. Do not give an, an inch. But, but be there resisting the, the massive onslaughts of the the enemy. Uh, so then uh, Paul talks about the elements of the armor. You know, uh, verse 14 and following. So truth, uh, your, your loins girded in truth. Uh, the enemy, Satan, is the father of lies. And Jesus is uh, the way, the truth, and the life. So those are the two contrasts. You know? And you need to know the truth. Because many... Christians, again, uh, today do not know the truth. They fall for the falsehoods uh, and half-truths of the enemy. And what is happening in the world today, even among many Christians, they, the, the good has become bad and the bad has become good. You know? What was obviously wrong, like, like uh, uh, abortion and active homosexuality, is now accepted and even uh, supported or endorsed even by uh, some clergy within the church. So you need to know the truth. Uh, your, your law is gilded in truth. Then there is righteousness as a best plate. You know? uh, we need to be righteous. We need to be pure. We need to be holy. We need to, uh, as we were talking about, strive to uh, rid uh, our lives of, of sin. And that's a best plate. It protects our, our, our heart, you know. Uh, and, and the core of our heart ought to always be growing in the righteousness of, of God. You know? Then we have your, your feet shod in readiness for the gospel of peace. And again, uh, what we are called to uh, is not just to grow in holiness, in righteousness, but to go forth and proclaim the gospel. You know? and, and Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And we proclaim the gospel of peace. Then verse 16, hold faith as a shield to, to quench the uh, flaming arrows of the evil one. Uh, we need to be staunch in our faith. We need to know our faith. Because again, today there is confusion. Uh, and uh, many Catholics are no longer sure what really is the uh, authentic faith. They hear uh, different voices, opposing voices. And there can be much confusion. So we need to, to uh, know the authentic faith. And that can enable us to withstand the flaming arrows of the, uh, the enemy. Then he said, put on the helmet of salvation. Uh, the helmet that uh, protects our, our mind. You know, and our mind knowing we have been saved. We are a people of God. We are called to, 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 to act in a certain uh, way, to live our lives in a certain uh, way. And, and we don't veer away from that. We are, we are protected, again, from the assaults of the enemy. And then you take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the, 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 the Bible, you know, the very Word of God. It is a two-edged sword that cuts through bone and marrow and penetrates the inner recesses you know, of, of our being. You know, it, can, it can convict uh, it can really uh, help us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. So it's very, very 
crucial. If this is divine work that we're doing, then the Bible, the sword of the Spirit, is very, very uh, crucial. You know? And we can add in verse 8, with all prayer and supplication, pray at every opportunity in the Spirit. We already took a look at, look at that. We are pray with, to pray without ceasing. We are to pray at every opportunity. So that makes up the, the armor. Uh, much of it defensive, except for the sword of the spirit, which is both uh, a defensive and offensive uh, weapon. But we also need to have uh, the offensive weapons. And these are the weapons of righteousness. And it says here in 2 Corinthians 6, Verse 7, in truthful speech, in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness at the right and at the left. So again, truth uh, in everything that we say, that we do, we live out, we live out the, the truth. Jesus is the, the truth. And this is the way by which we can tap on to the uh, power of God. And we wield weapons of righteousness on the right and on on, on the left. So all of this is important. What, what are these uh, weapons of, of righteousness? First of all, your holy conduct. Your, 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 your growing sanctity. Your, your avoidance of sin. Uh, your, your witness of, of uh, a, a good, being a good uh, Christian. So, so your very conduct. Uh, how you are, uh, who you are, and and uh, our our consciences need to be clear, you know, clear conscience. We can stand before God and 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 defend you know, whatever it is we say, we do, we we think, and and our conscience is clear before man. Our conscience is is clear. You know? It says in two Corinthians four verse two. We have renounced shame, shameful hidden things, not acting deceitfully or falsifying the word of God, but by the open declaration of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of, of God. We renounce shameful things. We do not act deceitfully. We do not falsify the work of God. This has to do with holy conduct. This has to do with having a clear conscience. And... and uh, because of this, uh, we are okay, whatever it is that happens in our life. In 2 Corinthians uh, 6, verse 8, and, and uh, uh, Paul just having said, will the weapons of righteousness at the right and at the left. And then he says, through glory and dishonor, insult and praise, we are treated as deceivers and yet are truthful. So, it doesn't matter. Uh, of, of, well, in a way, it, it does matter. You know, we, we want the good things. But, but uh, in, in, in reality, uh, because it's always up to God to provide the fruit and to determine what will be the outcome of our efforts on his behalf. You know? So in that sense, it doesn't really matter. It might be glory or dishonor. You know? It might be insult or praise. Whatever it is, because we are secure in the reality that we are uh, conduct ourselves uh, in, in holiness and righteousness. We have a clean uh, conscience. We are serving our God. We are doing his bidding. We want uh, to please uh, no one but him, not even ourselves. So whatever is the outcome, you know, that's okay uh, with us. And if uh, that is our posture, then we are always victorious. Uh, whether there is a seeming defeat no, uh, in a particular battle, but we will always be victorious. In 2 Corinthians uh, 6, verses 9 to 10, uh, we are unrecognized and yet acknowledged as dying, and behold, we live as chastised, and yet not put to death, as sorrowful but always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. The seeming contradictions in life, you know, the seeming negatives, but really 
what we have in Christ are positives. We are okay, whatever happens, because the victory is ours. Oh, wow, I've uh, taken an hour. And uh, if you notice, we're just in the first four elements out of, out of 10. <laughs> so uh, let me see how I can uh, speed this up a, a bit. So, so we are equipped. The fourth thing, E, is equipped. So we're, we're all set. And if that's the case, we can be sent off to, to war. But as we are sent off to war, we need to be reliable. And that is now the fifth thing, the R, P-O-W-E-R, uh, reliable. That means trustworthy. That means uh, dependable. Just because you're in the army of God doesn't mean to say you're already dependable or reliable. Uh, we, we know very well the story of uh, Gideon. You know? And Gideon faced a very, very large force. He had an army of uh, 32,000 uh, compare, uh, small compared to the the, the enemy, army of 32,000, and God said, uh, that's too many. And God knew what he was going to do, and he wanted to make it clear to everyone that uh, the victory is entirely because of him and not because of the force of human arms. You know? And so uh, he told Gideon, and Gideon said, uh, those who are afraid, you can leave. 22,000 left. <laughs> they, were, they were afraid. You know? And still... God said, you still have 10,000, that's still too many, so give them a test. And by that test, uh, uh, God would find out who would be, can be relied on who, or who is unreliable. And 9,700 9, were uh, eliminated, leaving Gideon with just an army of 300. <laughs> and, and this is the situation today. Uh, everyone, by virtue of the sacrament of confirmation is supposed to be part of the army of God you know, to, to proclaim uh, the gospel. But uh, there are many who are clueless. They don't know about that. They don't know about that, that call as a Christian, that they are supposed to be soldiers of Christ. They have no clue at all. And then there are those who might have a clue but are selfish. They just think of themselves. I don't want to get engaged in that. Especially the way you describe it, you know, there's going to be oppression, opposition, uh, suffering and pain. Why, why should I uh, want something like that? You know, uh, I want the good things in life. So they're selfish. They don't want to go into that. And then there are those who maybe truly understand that they're against a formidable enemy. And so they are afraid. And, and so uh, they, they cannot be part of an army of reliable soldiers. Now, you know, you and I, brothers and sisters, we can rely on God. God is steadfast. God is true. We can rely on Him. But God should be able to rely on us as well. Why? Because we are tasked to do His work. He entrusted His very divine work to us, the all-important work of helping win souls for, for the kingdom. So we can rely on Him. Uh, God should be able to rely on, on us. What we are called to be are stewards. And what does uh, the Bible tell us about being stewards? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2. Now it is of course required of stewards that they be found trustworthy, reliable, dependable, trustworthy, can count on us no matter what, through the ups, through the downs. We never give up even when we uh, seem to have been defeated because in this uh, fight for our Lord, there are no defeats, only lessons to be learned. If you learn the lesson, then uh, you have achieved part of the victory because it will help you to gain uh, overt victory uh, the next time. We're familiar with the parable of the talents in Matthew uh, 25 verses uh, 14 and, and following, where there was this uh, master who was going on a journey, and so he called his three servants and entrusted his possessions to them. Uh, to the first, he gave five talents. To the, to the second, he gave two. And to the third, uh, one. And you, you know what happened. Uh, the first invested it. He doubled it. 
uh, second invested it, he doubled it. Uh, but the third one just buried it in the ground because he was afraid of his master. He was afraid to to, to lose what was interested to him. So uh, he, he played it safe and he just uh, left it there. You know? And uh, what, what, what happened you know, uh, when the master returned? Well, he, he said to the first two servants, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your master's joy. But to the, the third, you, you, you're good for nothing. You, you lazy servant, you really uh, condemn uh, that, that servant. You were, you were entrusted with this, with this talent and you're supposed to, to earn for me so that I get some return. But you, you just buried it. And, and the master called him, you wicked, lazy servant. And in verse 30, the servant threw him into the darkness. Yeah. You know, the, this uh, parable of uh, God entrusting uh, his, his gifts, his talents to us so we can do his work. And Jesus is like the master who went on a long journey. In fact, the journey of Jesus is quite long because it's until the end of time. Uh, he will only return at the end of time. But, but uh, it, it, it says here in verse 14, it will be as when a man was going on a journey, called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. Jesus entrusts his possessions to us. You know? And we are supposed to make use to bring about by, by the power of God the, the fruit uh, of, of our labor, of our using those, those talents, those, those gifts. And if not, we will be punished. Uh, severely. Remember, if you are entrusted with a great treasure, which is this divine work, which is this work of salvation, uh, what greater treasure could there be? This is what it is all about, the salvation of people, their souls making it to heaven. That is the work that we are being entrusted with. So if you are entrusted with that great treasure, then the expectations of God, the demands of God, will also be great. And what we don't want to do is to commit the sin of omission. You know? uh, we, we are given gifts and we do nothing about it. Uh, and that can be really a very, very serious sin. Because God might have wanted us to be used as his instrument for the salvation of a particular person, maybe someone close to us, and we uh, we didn't care to, uh, to to do that, and so that person is lost, and we're accountable for that. It's a grave sin. Okay, so if we are entrusted with God's very own work, that should humble us. Now, people in the world, it's the other way. Oh, I, I, I attain to the highest position in the corporation. Oh, I, I become the, the greatest uh, athlete. Uh, oh, I, I, I uh, wrote uh, the greatest uh, uh, laws or the greatest uh, novel acclaimed by, by everyone. And what comes in is pride. Now, here is God entrusting us with this greatest work and, and, and uh, leaving it up to us. He, Jesus goes off on a journey, will return at the end of time. But that should not bring us to pride. It should bring us to humility. Why? Because we know who we are. We're such sinners. We fall short. And, and we know on our own. In fact, when we start out in the Christian life, we're so fearful, we're so afraid when we're given service. Oh, you know, I can't do that. So we ought to know that. How can we? Weak, human, sinful flesh ever attain to, to, to achieve the very purposes of, of our, our God. So uh, that should bring us to uh, humility. And then, of course, as we engage in the war, uh, there will be victories, there will be seeming defeats. So as I said, if we learn the lesson, then defeats are also victories. But uh, even in victory, we will be bruised, we will be blooded. And maybe that's not something that you can be proud about. You know, your, your uniform is soiled and tattered and, and dirty and, and you're limping along and, and you know, your, your, your chest is not puffed up. 
and and uh, that that's the that's the uh, uh, situation. You know, uh, we we are not proud of that, and we know that if not for the Holy Spirit, where would we be? We really cannot accomplish the very work of God. So uh, we are mere servants, and a servants a servant is someone who ought to be humble because you take the lowest place. You have no cause to be proud as a servant. You're just following after the master. You're told what, what you are to do. You have no, no rights. So uh, what is natural for a servant, a mere servant, is humility. You do the work. You don't look to recognition or acclaim. Though, of course, in this work, we do look to the crown of righteousness and that the greatest reward that we can, we can ever, ever have. But uh, even after we have done our work, as uh, Jesus told uh, the servant who is out there in the field and, uh, you know, uh, he, he was telling people, if my servant is working all day, would I call him in and say, relax, you know, let me feed you? Or would he rather say, no, uh, 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 prepare my meal first and then after that you can, you can have yours? And then uh, Jesus said at the end of that in Luke 17 verse 10, if uh, you know we 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 are those servants, uh, uh, we 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 just did our obligation, you know, and we don't even seek to uh, for for gratitude or for acclaim or for anything like that. So this work, great as it is, great as it is, should be cause for for uh, uh, humility, you know, and. Uh, this is this is very very important because we know that it is pride that causes defeat. That's what happened to Lucifer, a great angel. He was proud. He thought he should be God, uh, and so he rebelled and he was defeated. He thrown out of heaven. He became uh, Satan. Uh, that's what happened to Adam and Eve. Uh, they had a perfect life. They were told not to eat of the fruit uh, in the middle of the garden. But uh, the devil said, "Oh, did God tell you that? You will not die." Uh, you will be like gods. So, so their pride was pricked. Oh, we can be like gods. So they ate of the fruit. They lost paradise. Uh, that's the way it is with the world today. You know, where mankind is uh, proud with its achievements, with its technological advances, sending people to the moon, and maybe at some time, uh, not in the distant future, to, 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 to Mars. And, and because of this, they think they are gods unto themselves, and they've uh, forgotten all about God. And this is the worst thing that can happen to, to us as we're doing uh, the very work of God. Because this is what uh, Peter said in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 to 6. Clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another, for God opposes the proud but bestows favor on the humble. God opposes the proud because he knows how great a sin that is. And, and because he loves us, you know, he, he, he will cut us down in order to prevent us from continuing to live in, in that pride so that, so that we would be, be humble. You know? uh, let's not wait for that time for God himself to chastise us. But it says in verse 6, So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. If you're a humble instrument, God knows he can make use of you. You know? And you will not be lost because of, of pride, deadly pride. So uh, that's, that's the uh, sixth thing that is important. H, uh, humble. Uh, now with all of those six aspects, we are ready to go forth. So we go to the seventh, O, on the offensive. The, the enemy is on massive uh, offensive. And uh, we are called to oppose the enemy. But in opposing the enemy, we do not just stand our ground. No. We, we should stand our ground. We should not fall back. We should not retreat. We should not yield territory to the enemy. But we also do not just stand our ground. But rather, we need to counterattack. We need to go on the offensive. We need to push against the enemy. We need to take territory uh, away from, from the enemy and expand the, the dominion of God in in, in the world. So we go on offensive. How else can we set, we help set other people free if we don't charge the enemy's dominion? So we're, we're here, we're standing fast, we're okay. 
our family is okay, our community is okay, but how about there's so many others out there who are currently in the dominion, under the dominion of the enemy. We need to go. We need to assault that dominion so that we can help liberate uh, those, those captives. You know? Again, this is all about uh, what was said in Matthew 16, verse 18. Uh, the church founded on, on the rock that is uh, Peter. And Jesus saying, the gates of the netherworld, the gates of hell, uh, will not uh, prevail against uh, the church. Meaning to say, it's the church that is on offensive, not, not defensive, but offensive. And when the church goes on offensive with the power of God, uh, the gates of the netherworld will not, will not uh, stand. No? So, uh, this talks about aggression. No? Uh, that sometimes is a bad word uh, in, in, in the world out there where people just want to be nice and accommodating and not offensive. So, aggression is uh, quite offensive. So, but, but that is how war is. You need to be aggressive. You need to be on the offensive. You even need to be violent. Now, if that uh, shocks you, think about what Jesus did at the temple. When he took a whip, of course, he started whipping people to, to drive them out and overturn the, the money changers' temples. Uh, that was quite uh, violent. No? But there is this, this uh, uh, good meaning uh, of, of violence, no? There, there's a bad meaning, there's a, a, a good uh, meaning, and we need to understand what, what uh, God is all uh, actually calling for here in uh, this uh, whole aspect of uh, aggression as his uh, army. Well, first of all, we see in Matthew 11, verse 12, it says here, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent are taking it by force. The enemy forces are violently assaulting the church you know, and taking it by, by force. You know. That's what the, the enemy is doing. You know. Now, in, in the face of that violence, what are you going to do? Politically correct? <laughs> just be nice? <laughs> just, just, just accept? Just embrace? <laughs> Uh, being assaulted violently in that way? No, that, that's not what we're uh, called to, to, uh, to, to, to do. Uh, but uh, talking about uh, violence in another sense, in the Gospel of uh, Luke, Luke uh, 16, verse 16, uh, it says here, From then on, the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone who enters does so with violence. You want to enter the kingdom of God? You need to do so with violence. Now, what does that mean? When you, you look it up in your dictionary, it, just, it doesn't just mean the, the, the usual negative connotation of, of violence. You know, you're building, uh, you're beating something, someone up, and oftentimes uh, unjustly. It is not just that. But what violent also means is passionate. Uh, fierce in conviction, intense. And that's the way that we ought to go on the offensive. Fierce, passionate, uh, intense, going all out. This talks about determination, about, uh, about zeal. You know? And it's a measure of our effort. You, know? you don't just... You know, there's the, the, the walls of the enemy, the, the fort that that needs to be assaulted, and you know you don't just <laughs> saunter in, knock at the door. You don't do that. You you assault. You 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 hurl those stones to try to bring down those walls. You put your your siege works uh, against the wall and try to to break through. You break down the the the, the massive gate. That's all violent, you know? and it's a good description of how. Uh, determined and passionate we ought to be in going on the offensive. Okay, number eight, uh, you, unrelenting. Uh, that, that's uh, uh, different from this aggression, violent, uh, but uh, it means that you, you keep at it because souls are being lost even now. 
and and uh, the 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 war, unlike unlike maybe the the wars in other places, a uh, uh, few days of fighting, and then there's a lull, and the opposing comes, they they're resting or you know, but this the enemy is unrelenting, he's always at it, and so we also need to be always uh, at at it, you know, and souls are being lost. Uh, even when we're dilly dallying or we're we're preoccupied with other things, especially worldly things, we need to keep at it. We need to be to be persistent. Uh, this is what uh, Paul tells uh, Timothy in his uh, second letter uh, to Timothy four, verse two. Paul says to Timothy, "Proclaim the word." Be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Convince, reprimand, encourage through all patience and teaching. Be persistent, whether convenient or inconvenient. In fact, war is never convenient. If we're looking for convenience, if we're looking to make it to heaven in first-class comfort, we, we have the wrong idea. This is this is this is war that we are uh, engaged in. So we we persist, we 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 go uh, at it. When we achieve victories, we don't rest on our laurels. We never say, "Oh, I, I've done enough." Oh, look 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 at, at, at this. What we have we have accomplished. You know, uh, we've had we've had our uh, CLS and we have this this harvest. So we'll wait six months till the next one. No, you might be missing great opportunities that will be there. And you need to just uh, keep at it. Move on to the next battle. And, and we, we, we never are able to reach uh, as many as we can. In the work of uh, LCSC, ideally, we, we, we don't know how it could uh, happen unless we get the embrace of the uh, church hierarchy. But the intent is to reach all Catholics. One billion Catholics in all the parishes throughout the world. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, don't worry too much. It's not just you and I uh, who will do that work, but uh, we need to engage more and more soldiers to be part of the army. But he's just saying that that work uh, needs to be unrelenting. Okay, let's move on. We're now at the ninth. Yes. Self-sacrificial. So we'll be, we will be bruised, we will be bloodied. Uh, there is there's a, a sacrifice to, 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 to self. And in fact, we see that the way, God's way to victory is through the cross. How did Jesus win for us our salvation? Not as a uh, conquering king. No. Uh, he is king, he did conquer, but he went by way of suffering servant. And, and he embraced the cross. He gave his life on, on the cross. And by his death, by his resurrection, that's how he won the, the victory. So what does you say to us about being uh, disciples? In Luke 9, verse 23, he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, embrace his cross daily, and, and, and follow me. So we're talking here of self-denial. We're talking here of embrace uh, of the cross. We're talking here of following Jesus without concern for, for self. All of that is being self-sacrificial. A soldier, by the very nature of being a soldier, is willing to give up his life. You, you cannot really be a, a worthy and reliable soldier if you, you're so protective of your life. I mean, you, you need to be careful. You're going to battle. You, you are careful. But you know that there is a possibility that you will lose your life. And, and if you uh, just look at that and say, I don't want to lose my life, then you won't even get into battle. But you get into battle, you know that that can, that can uh, happen. But that is the posture of a authentic, an authentic Christian. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 21, For to me life is Christ and death is gain. It is our privilege to share in the suffering of Christ. And of course, we uh, look to eventual uh, glory. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we read in Romans 8, 
verses uh, 17 to 18. Talking about, uh, if only we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. And Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present life are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us. And that's important. We need to look forward to the crown of righteousness that will be awarded to, to, to uh, the, the uh, victorious soldiers. We need to want to hear our Lord say to the faithful servant, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's joy. That's what we look forward to. That is the glory. And that glory is so awesome that it should be able to help us uh, uh, endure uh, all the difficulties and challenges that we face. Uh, in fact, we are when we become self-sacrificial, uh, again, it, it is a cause for great joy. It ought to be a cause for great joy for, for all of us. Uh, Peter says in uh, 1 Peter 4, verse uh, 13, But rejoice to the extent that you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice exultantly. That is our destiny. And as long as we are faithful and we uh, follow through on everything that God wants us to do and for uh, what to happen in our lives, then we will enter into that glory with great joy. Okay, finally, we're into the 10th uh, aspect. E, powerhouse, E, enduring. You know, uh, again, uh, there will be many uh, trials. We keep going back to, to all of this because, you know, that's the reality of, of, of war. You know? But it brings out uh, different aspects of uh, how we ought to be. But there will be more many trials. Uh, Paul says in Acts uh, 14, verse 22, he says, It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, you're not going to get in there in first class comfort. Uh, there will be many hardships if we want to enter into the kingdom of, of God. Uh, and especially today, we have entered already into the uh, end times. And uh, uh, when Jesus was asked what, what are the signs of the end, and he gave uh, some of those signs, uh, many would have happened even at the time up to the destruction of Jerusalem, but many can also be projected to uh, this time, uh, the final uh, time. In Matthew 24, we see the all the different uh, signs that were there, verses 9 to, to 12. Uh, you see that uh, Christians will be persecuted. They will be hated by all. They will be betrayed. Uh, there will be false prophets who will deceive. There will be an increase in evil doing. All of these things are there. You know? And when we see that, that is so very trying. We need to endure. You know? We need to persevere. And it says in Matthew 24, verse 13, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. And that is the goal. Remember, never lose track of that. Our own salvation and helping others to attain to their salvation, already won for them by our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, when we do endure to the end, we will be saved. Uh, there's, a, there's a bonus in that as well. In the next verse, in verse 14, uh, Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. God wants everyone to have the opportunity to hear the gospel. Then they can make their own decision, to accept or to reject. But they were given the opportunity. And Jesus says, then that's uh, only the time when uh, the end, when Jesus will return in glory, the, the, the end of time, the end of the, of, of the world. We are to see this war to the end, obviously. Because until the very end of time, when the final defeat of the evil one, uh, the evil one will continue to wage war against God's people. And so we cannot let our guard down. We are constantly uh, on that uh, war, standing past and also going on the counterattack, on the counteroffensive. So we see that war to the end. We endure. So brothers and sisters, 
To be holy is to be set apart, to be uh, God's own. And to be a warrior is to engage in the war. So we're called to be uh, holy warriors. So to be a holy warrior is to do God's divine work. And when we look at uh, God's work, we focus on uh, the spiritual war that is raging all around us. It is unfortunate that many Christians, many Catholics uh, miss that. Because if you don't understand what is happening in a spiritual war, then you're going to miss everything else. And, and many of the things that we've talked about will be no, not really of, of interest to you because uh, you, you might not need or you might not heed, heed that call. So that is truly unfortunate. But if you understand, then this is it. We are in spiritual war. And to be victorious as the church in the end, we'll be victorious as Jesus, having crushed the head of the serpent with our mother Mary. Uh, they are already victorious and we share in that victory. We are called to be both stronghold and powerhouse. May God be praised.